Good evening, everyone. We chose the topic tonight to speak about how to achieve happiness in life. And uh, before, before we get into it, in one minute I'll tell you a little bit about me. I know I've been giving lectures mainly scientific proofs and proving Jews all over the world that the Torah that the Jews have is the only book that God gave humanity. Some religions, they think that their uh, Quran or their New Testament was given by God to a prophet. So what I do is, I prove that Christianity wasn't given by God, it was given by people like us, and it's full of mistakes. And I prove that the Quran wasn't given by God, it was given by people, because it's also full of mistakes. And the Torah that is 3,320 years old, since we got the Torah in Mount Sinai, is the only book that nobody can find mistakes in it. It's 100% divine. And I don't, it's not the topic tonight, therefore I brought you some DVDs, free of charge. It's very good. There's a lot of demand for these DVDs. And uh, all, I, all I just need from you is when you take these DVDs, you watch them at home. It's divided to three different sessions. The part one, which is about an hour, it's proving... No, 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 we, we don't need it. Why should it be so dark? It's not good for the camera, no. No, no, just keep it the way it was, with light. Keep it fully light, yeah, like this. Even more, even more. Even more, it's better for the camera light. A anyway, so... So the first part of the film, it's scientific proof. Scientific proof that the Jews really stood around Mount Sinai, millions of Jews, and heard the voice of God. Prove, not stories. Stories everybody can make. Proving scientifically, how do we know for sure the Jews received the Torah? And also the difference between Judaism to all the other 80,000 religions and cults that came after. 80,000 religions and cults started after the Torah. What's the difference between us and them? How do we know we are the original and we are the only one that God gave? And everything else is baloney. That's part one. Part two, it's showing inside the text of the written Torah and the oral Torah, Torah Shebe'al Peh, that it's all divine. Not only the written Torah is divine, the oral Torah is also divine. All the information that the Chachamim, the Rabbi, passed from generation to generation, all their knowledge, it's all divine information. A person couldn't know. For instance, two million animals in the world, and there's only four exceptional animals that have only one sign of kashrut. That's something that a person could never know. Nobody knows two million animals by heart. The renewal of the moon to an exact number, five digits after the decimal point, which even with a calculator today, you cannot calculate. You need a mega computer to measure the renewal of the moon every month. This is divine information. The number of the stars in universe, this is 3,300 years ago we got that. Until, until 400 years ago, nobody was able to know how many stars in the world. But the Torah, the Gemara, writes 10 to the power of 19 stars. This is information that people could not know. And many, many other examples, red cow, codes in the Torah. Believe me, you're going to enjoy it very much. That's part two. Part three, it's the purpose of life. Why God created this world for? Why did he put us here? What's the job of each Jew as individual, male, female? And what's the job of the entire nation of Israel? What's the purpose of giving us Torah 2,400 years after the world was already created? Only then, 2,400 years later, God decided to give us the Torah, and since then, 3,320 years, we have the Torah that passed from generation to generation. How does the free choice work? If we have a free choice, we all know that God knows the future. And the minute that he created us, he basically saw how we're going to die, righteous or wicked. He already saw everything. If he saw the end, literally, if we think about it, that shows that we don't have a choice. 
But when we read in the Torah, the Torah says clearly, I'm giving you the life and the good, the bad and the death, and you should choose the good. That means we could choose the bad, as we all do all the time. But we could choose the good, we could choose the bad. That means it's 100% in our hand. Also, the Torah is full of rewards, but it's also full of punishments. Punishments you don't give to a robot. If you have a robot and you move him with a remote control, le go left, go right, goes forward, and the, and the robot falls downstairs, you're not picking him up and beating him up. What are you doing? Why you not see where you're going? What do you mean? You're moving him. If we were all robots and God made us and he moves us left and right and he decides for us what's going to be, why did he bother giving us a book telling us, be careful, you should not kill, you should not rape, you should not eat not kosher, you should not, you should not, so many you should not. And the point is that we, ha we all have to understand that because the Torah is designed in a way of reward and punishment, because the Torah said that we have a 100% free choice, then for sure we have. But it's very difficult for us to understand, so I explain in the video how does it work. Then we, and we also one more common questions that people have, what's going to be in the afterlife? We're all living the moment. Most people want to have pleasure now, not thinking what's going to be when they die one day, what's going to be after. Comes the Torah and tell us, wake up, dear Jew. You are only here. I only put you in this life for a test. It's all a test. What you're going to earn here, that's what you're going to have over there. If you're not going to earn anything, you're not going to get anything over there. So when you earn something here, you're going to be able to go over there and cash, cash out your reward. And whatever your level is going to be, that's what God's going to give you. Or if you're going to be wicked, God forbid, you go against the Torah, against the orders of God. Torah in Hebrew means instruction. Torah comes from the word oraa instructions. The name of the Torah already show what it means. God gave us instruction what to do, what not to do. If we trust him and we follow his advice and orders, for sure we benefit. If we go against him, we are going to pay a very heavy price. So I explained the concept of reward and punishment. Now comes the famous question that everybody asks, Jews and non-Jews, they all ask this question, and that's going to lead me to the subject tonight. If you claim that God exists and God gave the Torah, and we read in the Torah that the righteous people getting rewarded and the wicked people were go, you know, going to get punished, how don't we see it in our life? Look around the world. The wicked people, some of them are very wealthy. They celebrate, they cheat, they lie, they steal, they rape, they murder, they speak bad about people all the time. And they make millions. They're healthy, they dress nice, they drive nice cars, they live in nice mansions, they have five, six different houses, private jet. You know, they come on the news, they lie to the whole world. Uh, they throw atomic bombs and kill millions of people. You know, look at them. Everything is fine. And look at the rabbis. Some of the rabbis don't even have a car to drive to the lecture. Where is the justice? If this rabbi, God loves him so much, and he gives his life for the public to teach them Torah, to make them better, to help them, to make peace between husbands and wives, to teach the kids what to do, how is it possible that the rabbi only have $2,000 in his checking account, and this wicked murderer has $2 billion in his checking account? So the conclusion is, there is no God, there is no justice, it's all baloney. Don't waste our time, Rabbi. Go and goodbye. This is what most people always walk around. Whenever they try to be closer to God, this was keep them away. When they see that there's really no justice. So the answer to this is in the video. But it's very, very simple. If the Torah didn't address this question, this issue, then we will have a very serious problem. You're right. Holocaust, children are getting murdered. They put the wicked Jews and the righteous Jews in the same oven. The Nazis didn't care what you are. You have a beard or you don't have a beard. So it looks that it's coincidence. Bad luck. Bad luck. The poor children, you know, bad luck. They were there in the wrong generation they born. So they killed them. That's what it looks like. 
comes the Torah, and the Torah says, no, my friend. The reward and the punishment, the timing of the reward and the punishment, only I, me, God, will decide when to give it. I will not make a system that work instantly, which means whenever a person make a sin, he's going to get punished right away. And whenever he's going to make a mitzvah, a good deed is going to get rewarded right away. Why it cannot work that way? It's impossible. The answer is, if every time a person would make a mitzvah, he would make a gift for it, he would get a gift for it right away, or whenever a person would make a sin, who will get the punishment that the Torah says right away, this will eliminate the free choice. There will not be any free choice anymore. Why? I'll give you one example. The Torah said that the Jews are not allowed to create any fire on Shabbat. No fire at all. It's clearly in the Torah. Lo tevaru esh b'chol moshvotechem. The Torah also said right next to it, what is God's punishment for Jews who don't listen to him? But we see today that 70, 80% of the people, they don't care. They light fire, they smoke, they speak on the phone, they drive cars on Shabbat. And it seems that business is usual. The answer is, God says, if when a person lights a cigarette on Shabbat, I will have to give him the punishment right away, that means the first Jew that lights a cigarette, it will explode in his face. Comes the next Jew, light a cigarette on Shabbat, it's exploding his face. From this moment on, all the people in the world, as soon as Shabbat comes, they will stand like this. They will be afraid to move. It's a dangerous day. People are dying everywhere. Look, this guy started his car, boom, explosion. This guy stole $200. A second later, he lost 400 The Torah says, when you steal, your punishment is to pay double. So if you rob the bank and you stole a million dollars from the accounts of all the Jews in your town, tomorrow, by the latest, you should have lost double. You stole two million, you lost four million. Everybody see, oh, perfect justice. If this is the way the world was, then God didn't need to create this world. The Torah already told us that this world is a place of a test. What does it mean, a place of a test? It's all confusing. It's all scrambled together in a way that when you look at that, it's very hard to know. But when you read the instruction in the Torah, they are very, very clear. There's no way to make a mistake. I'll give you an example of what I mean. When you go, I used to be in the Air Force in Israel. So one rule, when the pilot gets on the F-16, there's a very solid rule that they always tell the pilots. You have a computer inside that the computer shows you how the plane is flying. If the plane is straight or is, go, is upside down, the computer shows you by the wings. If the two lines on the, on the edge of the wings are high, that means you, you're flying straight now. If the lines are going down, that means the plane is upside down. So you have to turn it around. You have to move the stick a little bit, the plane turns around. Now, when you fly above New York and above Tel Aviv, you don't need a computer. You look down, you see buildings. You look up, you see blue, so you know. What happens if you fly in the ocean? It's all blue around you. Sometimes when they fly, they go in all kinds of maneuvers. They go around, left, right, they turn around a few times. Then after the, the pressure is over, he's not sure how he is now. Am I flying straight or am I upside down? Looking up, blue. Looking down, it's all blue. Looks around, it's all blue around him. He doesn't know, he's alone in a world. Now comes the computer, and the computer shows him in what situation he is. However, the conscience of the person, it's also a computer. And the computer of the human being sometimes can make mistake. What mistake? Many pilots, unfortunately, they crash to death because they forgot the rule. What is the rule? No matter when you have a contradiction between your brain and the computer, you must follow the computer. Don't believe yourself. If you turn around a few times and you think you are flying straight, but the computer show you you upside down, don't believe yourself. Follow the computer. Now, some pilots, they were sure that I'm flying straight. It cannot be that I'm upside down. So they pulled the stick up to go higher, and they went right into the ground or into the, into the, or into the water. A second later, they already 
falling into the water. Why did I tell you this? Because this is the way we have in our life. Many times the Torah say to you, if you're going to do this, this is what's going to happen. You do it, and it doesn't happen. One year, two years, three years, you have big questions. Sometimes you see that the Torah say you should not do this and this and this, and you are doing it, and it seems that it worked very well for you. Oh, good thing I didn't listen to the rabbi. If I listened to the rabbi, I would lose a lot of money. i give you an example. Sometimes a person comes to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, I want to buy this business. It's a million dollar investment. Should I buy it or not? The rabbi looks in the business and says, you should buy it. Yes, buy it. Good luck. Mazal ubracha. The Torah says every question you have in life, you have to ask the rabbis. And they have to answer you based on this Torah, not based on their opinions. Vushalta otam, the Torah says, you're going to ask them. Kol asher yomru lecha tishma bekolam. Everything they tell you, you must listen to them. This is what God says in his Torah. Do not move left or right from the orders that they gave you. But the Torah says clearly, Kol asher yorucha al pi Torah azot. Everything they will direct you based on this Torah, you must listen to them. But if the rabbi comes and tells you something about sport, you don't have to listen to him. If he talks to you about the weather or something, who's to say that you have to listen to him? He gives you instruction about life, do this, do not do this, get married, don't get married, get divorced, don't get divorced, whatever the situation is, based on the Torah and the Allah, you have to listen to him and I will supervise your transaction from now on because I know you're listening to me and you listen to my representative, which is the rabbi in your generation. That's what the Torah says. So the rabbi told him, buy the business. So he, went, he bought the business, and a year later, he lost a lot of money. The business went bankrupt. So he lost a million dollars, plus a year of his life. Every day he goes to work, he comes back at night, aggravation, problems, he loses merchandise, all kinds of problems. A year later, he closed the business. So this is exactly the situation with the pilot. What does the pilot say? The computer tells me one thing, my brain tells me the opposite. And this is it. The person is walking around 20 years. Once in my life, I finally asked the rabbi what to do, and I lost a million dollars. You see, it's all nonsense. Shouldn't, shouldn't have listened. But the, here is where the big mistake is. He doesn't know that when you come to a big rabbi, and he tells you what the Torah told you to do. For instance, the business is kosher. It's not kosher. It's in a good place. It's not in a good place. Hashem is doing what's good for the person always, but the person doesn't see it. So that means this person was supposed to die this year, or God forbid his family or anything like that. He doesn't know that. So Hashem says, on Rosh Hashanah, which is the judgment day of the person, Hashem decides for every one of us everything that's going to happen between this Rosh Hashanah until next Rosh Hashanah. If we make money, how much we make, we're going to be healthy, we're not going to be healthy. God forbid in Rosh Hashanah the verdict was death, chas v'shalom. And he's a young person. And he has $10 million. And Hashem said, okay, instead of killing him this year, I want him to continue to live. The test is not over. So I will switch the punishment from death to a money lost. Money lost is replacement for death. Not, not that many people know, but the Torah says that Esav wanted to kill Yaakov, his brother. We know, it's a famous story. Esav is coming with 400 men to kill his brother Yaakov for stealing his Bechorah, for tricking him, to take the blessing from Yitzchak. It's a famous story, even the Goim knows it. But before, he sent his son Eliphaz. Eliphaz was the son of Esav. When he was the kid, Yaakov was teaching him Torah. So Yaakov was his rabbi, and Esav was his father. Now when your rabbi tells you one thing, and when your father tells you one thing, you have a contradiction. This is your father, and this is your spiritual father. So Esav told him, go and kill your uncle Yaakov. Eliphaz comes to Yaakov and says, what should I do, Rabbi? Tell me what's the law. My father told me to kill you, and obviously you're going to tell me not to kill you. So who should I listen, to you or to my father? So Yaakov told him, I have a way for you to do like your father and like me, and no contradiction. What? Take away all my money, here, all the sheep, all the cows, leave me with nothing. And you can go back to your father and tell him that you killed me. Why? Because the Torah says, someone who had money and he lost all his money, he became broke completely, what we call today bankruptcy or whatever, 
That's like that punishment. It's count like Hashem killed him, even though he continued and he built his empire again and he makes much more money 10 years later. No problem. It's already counted that he got his punishment in his lifetime. Not to talk about all the aggravations around it, but this is a situation what happens. So sometimes Hashem wanted this rabbi to direct him to go into that business because that's the only way for him to lose a million dollars in a short period of time, and we don't see it. I'll give you an example. One guy in Israel, he was 55 years old, and he was working for 30 years in a factory. For 30 years. Now in Israel, I don't know the rules in America, but in Israel this is the rule. When you get to 65 years old, you retired for life, you have a very large pension, you get a big amount of money, plus monthly payment, whatever, social security. But in Israel, they have something that's called early pension. When sometimes the company, they're not doing so well, and they want to fire people, so they rather go to the older people and convince them to leave, to retire early, they give them money, less than when they get to 65, but they offer them, let's say, half or something, they give them the money, and like this, they don't have to fire 30, 25 years old workers, they know they begin their life, so like this, they don't have hard feelings. This is how it works. Now he's 55, he gets a letter to come to the big manager, he comes to his office, the manager say, my friend, you know, we're not doing so well this year, we, we must fire people. Now, instead of firing people, I'm asking first all the older people. You are 55. You can get an early pension. We're going to offer you such money. It was about $300,000 after 30 years he worked. In 300000 at that time, he could buy three apartments in Israel. Not in a fancy area, in an average place, but three apartments he could buy. And this is what he needs to buy for his three children. He has three children. He was marrying them. And his plan was, one day when I retire, I'll be able to help my children. But at the same time, he's 55 years old. He doesn't want to sit home now. He wants to work. He has another few years to work. So he said, I'm not interested to quit. I have time. Why, why should I volunteer? I told him, I'm sorry. If you're not going to agree, we will force you to agree. We have no choice. This is the order we got. He went to the other manager and to the other manager until he got to the president of this huge company, to the top sending letters, appealing. Finally, he got to the top person in this company. He sits with him, he said, okay, we're gonna review what you said, what you submitted, I'll give you an answer in a few days. A few days later, he get a final answer. You cannot stay in the company, you must go by this day to accept your pension. If not, we're gonna have to fire you. So he goes, he went to the rabbi. He said, rabbi, what should I do? I tried this, I tried this. So the rabbi told him, this is the rule. In our life, Hashem says that everything you do in your life, you have to put reasonable effort. You, have, you cannot kill yourself. You have to put reasonable amount of effort, which means if it's possible to work eight hours a day and to make a living, comfortable living, you don't need to kill yourself and work 16 hours a day. And it's not necessarily going to bring you more money because anyway, Hashem is deciding your parnasa. So if you have to be, if you need a surgery, so you ask one or two opinions, the doctor has good reputation, you don't have to go to the best doctor in the world. The doctor is okay, he has good reputation, no accidents in his record. That's your ishtadlu, that's your efforts, you make the surgery. So the rabbi told him, you did everything you could, the, the maximum, there's nothing else you can do. What are you worried? You the boss of this world? You have a boss, he's watching your plans, he has a plan for you. Take the money and we'll see what Hashem's going to show you. Take the money. He went, he took the check. Ten days after, he got a massive heart attack. It's a real story that happened. It's only a few years ago, this story. Massive heart attack. He went to the hospital. By a miracle, they saved his life. He was close to death already. After the open heart surgery, months he was in the hospital. Slowly, slowly he was able to walk again, to move his legs. After a few months in the hospital, he came out and he wrote a letter to Rav Zilberstein. It's a very famous Rav. He wanted to tell his story. So he said, just listen to this. If I would insist to argue with them, I could appeal again. You know, they send me an answer. I could appeal. I could go to court. I can continue. I would refuse to get the check. I would get the heart attack. They won't give me the check after that. 
Because when you quit, your pension is nothing compared to when they force you to leave. It's a big difference. If you want to get fired, you don't, you're not entitled for this large pension. You get something, whatever. So if I would continue 10 more days to fight with them, then I would get a heart attack. I would be in a hospital. It's, uh, I'm limited. I cannot do anything. I would lose the apartment. At least now, I have each one of my son an apartment which I was able to get for them. So the idea is the person has to recognize that our knowledge about our life, it's not even 1%. We don't know. Each one of us has millions of speeches to give about how terrible his life is, how difficult it is, how he doesn't have good luck, how he should have been here and now he's here, and how he should have got married to this person and instead he did this, and why didn't I do that, and many, many other things about our past and about our future. The truth is, most of the time, if we review all the tears that we had, we will find that it was for nothing. For instance, a person went on a date. He's 25 years old, the girl is 22. It looks like a perfect match. They go out, I don't know, a few times, and he loves her very much. He's willing to give everything to marry her. Then she decides, she hesitates, she said, no, I don't want. He tries, he speaks to the father, he speaks to her friends, to, her, to the rabbi, nothing helps, she doesn't want. For years he goes depressed. For years, he doesn't see her anymore, she goes somewhere else. Now he cries for something he doesn't know. Maybe it's the best thing that happened to him in his life. I know a case that I was involved with, that one guy was running after a girl, doing everything that he could to marry her. She didn't want him. In the end, she got married to somebody else. By today, it's more than 10 years she's barren. She cannot have children, this one. Now, until today, I never told him, because I don't want to speak Lashon Ra about her, but until today, he doesn't know what he got saved from. Plus, I have an opposite case. I have a case of a guy that I like very much. I actually had the merit to make him religious. And he became very serious. He goes to yeshiva. He's serious. I'm not serious. Baal tshuva. And one time, somebody came to me and told me a story about him. And through the story, that person didn't know because he wasn't knowledgeable. I found out that that guy that I like is actually a mamzer. A mamzer. I don't know the right word for it in English. My wife said say to me not to use the ordinary word that the, the goyim use. It's not respectable. A mamzer means... A married woman that cheated on her husband and had a kid from another man, that boy, it's an illegitimate boy, which, according to the Torah, he can only marry a mamzeret like him, a girl that she is from the same status, which is not, it's not so simple. Where are you going to find now? Even though in Israel, believe it or not, they have a list of all the male mamzers, and all the female mamzers, yes, because based on testimony of people, they write them in a black list. Lo alenu, it's very difficult because if a person is in his list and he doesn't know, he goes up one day to get married, he files for his paper for the rabbanut, they tell him, sorry, you cannot get married. You're on a black list. According to the Torah, God says, lo yavo mamzer bikal Hashem. So now, I found out that this guy is this case. And then there was one girl that was dying to get married to him. She did everything. She tried. She sent her uncle, this, that. She went on a shiduch with her, and he didn't want. And she was calling me and sending me emails. Maybe I'll talk to him. And I was giving her all kinds of excuses <laughs> and thinking to myself, I'm feeling a little bit like God today. This is how God laughs at all of us. We laugh. We try. This is what we say in the Torah. Rabot machashavot belevish. A person is planning and having many, many thoughts, but in the end, Hashem is sitting up there and laughing at us. You think this is good for you? You think this is good for you? You do not know what's good for you. So the Torah says like this. Two and a half years, the greatest rabbis of the Jewish nation, Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel, were sitting in a yeshiva and arguing about one question. Guess what question they had in mind? All the hundreds of Chachamim from the Yeshiva of Hillel and all the hundreds of Chachamim from the Yeshiva of Shammai are arguing back and forth with letters, with argument. Was it good 
for a person that God created him. Is it good that God created us here or it would be better off not to be created? Now let me ask you a question. First, we, we, the ordinary people, we're not like them. We don't know one millionth of a percent of Torah of what they used to know. They used to know all the Torah by heart from the, to the end to the beginning. Not from the beginning to the end, from, in reverse. That's how great those people were. If you read a little bit about their knowledge in the Talmud, you, you, you're doubting to yourself if these people were people or angels. You're not sure. Because you're not, you cannot believe that people today would have 1% of their knowledge. If a person would have 1% knowledge of Hillel in this generation, everybody in the world would bow down to him. Because it's out of the ordinary. But 2,000 years ago, people had nothing in their life. They didn't have cars and vacations and yacht and jet ski and diamonds and fair coats and all these vacations here and Pesach in hotel. And they didn't have this kind of uh, lifestyle. They had only one thing in their life. Five, six in the evening, it's dark already. There's nothing to do. No television, no cards to play. <laughs> like today, people look for all kinds of entertainment to keep them busy. These people, from the minute they could until the minute they died, they were learning all the time. Sitting and learning Torah. A father would come home five, six in the evening, it's getting dark. They're having a special lamp with, uh, with candles. And they used to sit Torah and learn Torah with the kids. The neighbors, the people, the rabbi in the neighborhood, that's what they have in their life. The entertainment was learning. Learning in the morning, learning in the afternoon, learning in the middle of work until a customer will walk in. They were constantly learning because there was nothing else to do. There was nothing else. No internet, no Game Boys, no, I don't know, chatting in the internet. All these things that people try to keep themselves busy all the time. They didn't have all this. There was one thing to do. Torah, Torah, Torah all the time. So they sit and thinking, is it better that Hashem made us or would be better off not to? And in the end, the final conclusion after two and a half years would be better off not to be created. So what, are you going to contradict God? God doesn't know what he's doing. Torah said that everything Hashem does is the best that could be. So when we have an advice for Hashem, sometimes we say, I wish Hashem would do this part in the world a little bit different. It would be so much greater. For instance, I wish we would not have uh, to forget. We wouldn't have forgetfulness. Never. Never forget anything. Life will be so great, remember everything you learn, you never forget the key, you drive all the way to work, you come to open your store, you just realize your, your key is in great negative, you have to go all the way back now. It's a lot of problems with forgetting. You forget the flight, the date, you make a mistake, so many things you forget. You forget your wife's birthday and you're out of the house by now. It's a lot of things in life. <laughs> you don't even remember my birthday. So why God made forgetfulness? It looks like a problem, a defect in a creation, no? The answer is, just imagine life without it. A person would get a phone call two in the afternoon. Moshe, yes, we're very sorry to tell you, your mother, God forbid, just got hit by a car and she died. What would happen to this Moshe? No, what? It cannot be. No, yes, come and see. He comes to the hospital, you see, he begins to scream, to cry on the floor. He's crying. At this moment, he doesn't care about the million dollar meeting that he has at five o'clock. It's already out of his mind. Does he care about the business now? He doesn't care about lunch that he didn't eat. He doesn't care about his back pain. He doesn't care about maybe tomorrow he's supposed to get married. Nothing bothers him. This moment, he has a tragedy. And his mind is, how horrible is my situation? And he cries for it. What makes this Moshe a month later walk in the street with a cigarette and laugh? A month later. You see him today, you see him a month later, it's different Moshe. Even in a Shiva, the first day you come, they're all broken. The second day, a little bit less. By the end of the week, you see already they almost, almost normal. A month later, he's back in business, he's flying here, flying there, he's driving, that's it. It's almost over. What happened? God made a system that a person will be able to move on. What? He makes him forget things. That's a cure for tragedies. If we wouldn't have it, we would see it. If this Moshe, now that got the phone call, is 20 years old, he would see it from now until age 70 in the same situation. 
for 50 years, he wouldn't be able to stop crying. So what's the cure for that? To forget, to move on with your life. So we always think we know better, but we don't really know that if you look at the entire picture of the creation, everything God did is, couldn't be better than what he made. If there was a way to make it a little bit better, it would be better. It's perfect. Now, why don't we see it? Because we are very limited. Just think for a second. We have 6.4 billion people in the world. Every second they move their hands, their mouth, their legs, exchanging checks, money, phone calls, driving, accidents, airplanes. So many things are moving, animals, birds, all over the world. And this is only one minute. Multiplied 70 years of the life of a person, go thousands of years back because it's all connected. What we have today, right? We're sitting here today in Great Neck because some Persian Jews decided to come to Great Neck 30, 40 years. They chose this place. It's all chain reaction. Maybe they're dead already, these people. Maybe they died already 20 years ago. But without them, we wouldn't be here. It's all one thing connects to the other. If you take one detail out of history, everything else will never be the same. So God is watching every transaction. Everything is connected. He has to move things around for everything to fall into place. We do not understand one little thing about our own life. Forget about our friend's life and other people that we see around. We don't understand one little thing in our life. For instance, one guy gave you a check and it bounced. And you're wondering why the check bounced. Can you prove why? You don't know his problems. Maybe he has this. Maybe he's in the process of divorce. Maybe he's... His tenant didn't pay him. It's a chain reaction. You give somebody a check, the check bounce, somebody in China will die tomorrow because of that. It's all chain reaction. Because the guy didn't get the check, he couldn't pay his supplier. The supplier owed mafia to the Chinese map. They went and they, you know, they tried to kill him and they ended up killing somebody else. And that person supposedly died because you bounce a check. Do you see the connection? You don't see the connection. It's all one thing leads to another. But we live in the illusion that we're not just as good as God. Why, I, why am I not rich? Something is defected here. Something is not working. Why I'm not healthy? God doesn't know what he's doing. How Yov told God after all his suffering, Yov, he told Hashem, Hashem, my name is Yov, not Oyev. Yov and Oyev is the same letters. Maybe you mix my name, but instead of Yov, you think I'm Oyev, I'm your enemy, that you hate me so much, you're giving me all this suffering. So this is, this is us. Now comes the Torah and says, this world is a place of a test. If I love you, I slap you more than others. I take away things from you. I torture you. I'm very strict with you. Why do I do it to you? Because I love you. How can it be? It doesn't make sense. It should be the other way around, right? When you love somebody, you want to give him all the time. Not necessarily. If your son comes to you and he wants cocaine, because he wants to feel good, he's depressed, he wants cocaine. Give me cocaine, Abba, you're rich. Give me, give me $5,000. I want to go. I want to feel good. I want to relax in my room. Give me. I want it. He cries for it. You give him, you don't give him. Why? It's bad for him. Does he know that it's bad for him? He's 15, 16. He doesn't know. He thinks it's the best thing for him right now. It's the only thing will get him out of depression. You know what's bad for him. He doesn't know. You don't give it to him. He cries. He says, why? You're torturing me. You go to a hospital. A doctor take a knife, cut the chest, do all kinds of things. It looks like he's killing you. Someone he doesn't know, he thinks, oh, the doctor is a murderer. Look, he, look what the knife he's using. Someone who knows, he knows the doctor is saving your life. Sometimes we pray to God, give me this. We say something specific, give me, give me, give me. And it makes us very miserable that we don't have it. And God knows that it's not good for us. If we're going to get it, it's the end of our life. But we don't know it. So this is how it works. A kid, a little kid, got wounded. And he has a cut in his arm. And he got cut from a metal. It's very, you know, it's very dangerous because maybe it's rusty. So you need a, t a tetanus, you know, tetanus. So uh, you come, he comes to his mother. He, he, he cries for what? He wants candy. He's two years old. He's cut now in his arm. 
And the kids, when they got hurt, what do they want from their mother? They know, and every time they cry, the mother comes and gives them a candy. So he comes to the mother and he cries for candy. Now the mother, she doesn't give him candy right now. What does she do? She gives him a shot. She takes him to the doctor and he gives him a shot. So he's thinking, what a cool mother I have. I'm asking for candy, I'm crying on the floor, and what does she do? Makes my situation worse. She comes with a needle and gives me a needle. This is us. We cry for one thing, and Hashem takes it away. The little that we have is taking away. We have X amount of money, we want to double it. We have good plans. We want to help the shul, we want to help our children. The little that we have, one day he comes and takes it. So we sit and cry. What happened in the end? It's all for our good, but we don't see it. I'll give you an example. One Jew was walking one day in a forest 200 years ago. And one guy came with a stick and started to beat him up. Breaking his bones, killing him. Wow, the Jew is all bleeding. The Jew got lucky, the king passed by with his soldiers. The king asked the guy, what are you doing? So he said, I'm beating him up. Why? He's a Jew. So the king said, well, I'm not allowing such a thing in my country. He told the soldier, arrest the guy bring him to trial in the palace and take this Jew to my doctor to take care of him, to make him brand new. They took both of them to the palace. The guy goes into the jail and the Jew go into the bed and they take care of him. A few days later when the Jew feels better, they make a trial. The king asked the guy, tell me, how many times you hit the Jew? Now the, 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 the guy was afraid to lie because maybe the king was hiding and he saw so he said, approximately a hundred times. I hit him approximately a hundred times. So the king looks at the Jew, he says, is it real? Is it true? He says, yeah, he's right, approximately a hundred times he hit me. So he said, okay, I want you to give him a thousand dollars for every time you hit him. The guy said, wow, what a punishment. He said, that's it. Every time you hit him, a thousand dollars. And you have three days to give him the money. If not, it's going to be a lot worse for you. So the guy said, okay, your majesty, no problem. The Jew began to cry. King see, the Jew started to cry. Until now, I wasn't crying. Now when the Jew finally made $100,000 like this, <laughs> he started to cry. So the king said, what, well, I'm not fair king? I'm not a fair judge? He said, no, your honor, you better than fair. So what's the problem? He said, no, I'm crying because when he was beating me up, I thought, what a bad life I have. Look what I'm going through. If I knew that every time he hit me with that sticks, I'm going to get $1,000 for one second at getting a patch, I would stand there for a week, let him give me a million patches. Why he only gave me 100? This story looks like a joke, but this is the secret of life. Where does it say in the Torah that this is how it works? It's inside the text. You don't need the rabbis to tell you. All you have to do is to know how to read, in any language, Persian, Russian, Hebrew, Arabic, whatever you want. What it says, Et asher yoav Hashem yeyasro. Someone that Hashem loves, is choking him, touching him. Wake up, my friend. Wake up, my son. Life is almost over. You are naked, you have no profit. Just your time will arrive, 78 years old, I have to take your soul out of your body, and you come to the trial, one year trial. That's why we say Kaddish, and the people who passed away, for one year. Why so, why so long? Two days, you say, Gadal with Kaddish for two days, and finished. Why you need to say one year? One year trial. Mishpat, Bashamayim, 12 months, one year. And that's why, as long as this father of us, or mother of us, or relative, is getting trial for one year after his death, we are trying to do our best to help him. How do we help him? There's a secret. By saying Kaddish, it's a special prayer that it makes the judgment looser, easy, a little bit easier. So his judgment is less. What is it like, in a way, that a judge in downtown wants to judge your father, and you came, you brought the judge a bottle of whiskey? A gift, grease mouse. For Christmas, you gave him a whiskey. Automatically, this judge, no matter how much he's going to say, what, you're trying to bribe me? What's going on? In the end, trust me, it's going to help your father. That's the psychology of a person. When I was 17 years old, my father got me a car. You see, you think it's good to get 17 years old kid's car. 
It's very big risk. Three days I'm driving, someone with a bicycle come. The truth is it wasn't my fault. It really wasn't my fault. It was night. There was no light there. I'm trying to make a left. As I make a left, somebody came with a bicycle. He wanted to go straight, but I started to make a left. So he should have gone to the other side. He thought he's going to be able to pass through before I'm going to make the turn. And I didn't even see him. That's the problem. If I would see him, I would stop. I send him, I don't know how many meters in the air. The next thing I find out, the guy is in the hospital. They, the cop come, take away my license. 17 years old, three days have license. The, the cop take his license. It's that sentence. So what did I do? Since I was a kid, the teacher told my mother, your son is going to be a big lawyer one day. You know, sometimes you're born with that. You know how to say the right words in the right time. <laughs> so I, may, I told my mother, make a good cake. I'm going to visit the guy in Wolfson Hospital in Israel. So I find out where he is. I'm going to bring him a cake. So I came to the place. I see the guy has teachers here, all kinds of things, cast. <laughs> you know how it is. You walk like this. Each one of your legs is five tons. Say, you know, I'm very sorry, I didn't see you. I see his mother there. In the end, it turns that the guy lived one block away from my home. We never saw each other. We, we grew up in the same level. I bring him the cake, we became friendly. Now I have a trial. I have to go to the judges to decide if he wants to give me back my license or not. My mother was suffering on her knees. She goes to the hospital once every two months or something like that. I went to the doctor. I picked up all the documents, 17 years old. I go to the judge. I see the judge in the... Uh, the first time I show the judge all the documents. He reads. He sees that I, I need to take my mother to the hospital. We don't have a car other than this. The judge looks at all of this. But, you know, you have the prosecutor. He's very angry. So I got lucky. When we came out of the trial... You know, all of a sudden, I take the elevator down. I see the judge in the elevator with me. So I tell the judge, thank you. Very nice to have patience for me. You're a very nice man. He didn't show me that he cares. But the next morning when I came, he said, I decided to give him back his license. <laughs> I had everything turned. You just told the judge one good thing. The judge became your friend. Five, six years later, I saw in the top and a front page of the newspaper in Israel that this judge used to get buckets of fish from the fish market, bribe, for all kinds of things that people used to bring him. The mind of a person is always searching for bribe. The Torah say, Lord, the Torah say to the judge, it's very interesting, people don't pay attention. The Torah say, Ki ashochad ye'aver ene chachamim v'yisalef divrei tzadikim. Bribe will make the eyes of a person blind and make the words that comes out of his mouth false. Why God used such language? He should have said the shohad will twist the justice. Finished. Well, we, know, we know that. You got bribed, that's it. Because the Torah didn't say that it's going to twist the justice. No. It says that it will make the judge blind which means the judge will still think that he made a fair trial. He doesn't realize it. He in his subconscious, he is more desiring this one and, the, uh, and against the other one. But he doesn't really think that he's doing something wrong. He's trying to be honest. But his subconscious already, everything the other guy say, right away he likes it. He see the logic of it. Why? For the little thing that he got. Even hello in the elevator, it's enough for him to be nicer to you than what he was supposed to be. So the Torah says, if the judge knows the person, he cannot be a judge. The, the Gemara brings a case, there used to be a rabbi, his name is Rabbi Anan. 2,000 years ago, he was a judge in a court. One time, somebody that he knew was sued for money, came to the base dean, to the court, and Reuven is suing Shimon, and this Rabbi Anan, he knows this Shimon. He knows him from, I don't know, from the market, from business, just knows him. So when they came, he told him, I'm sorry, the guy that you sue him, I know him, so I cannot be the judge in your case, but let me take you to my friend, the other judge, and I'll ask him to trial your case. So as he walking to another room in a building, the other judge was busy with two orphans. They tried to decide how to share their father 
estate to these two orphans. So they're sitting over there, and Rabbi Anan say to the judge, this guy suing this guy for money, I know this guy. He points at this Shimon, I cannot trial them. So why don't you take this case? So the judge was thinking, if Rabbi Anan came with them in a hallway, all the way to here to tell me that he knows him, to take the case, I guess they have good relationship, these guys. So he told the two orphans, please, your case is adjourned for tomorrow. Come tomorrow, 9 o'clock, and I have to take this case right now. So this guy, Ruven, started to have second thoughts. He said, what's going on here? I'm suing this guy. He's like the owner of this court here. Everybody knows him, all the judges. Right away, they give him a special treatment. Maybe I'm making a mistake. I'm going after this guy, and everybody gives him respect here. So he told the judge, you know what? I changed my mind. I give up. I don't want to sue him. Goodbye. He left. So the Torah said that Shimon owed him the money. Now Shimon dies one day. He comes to Hashem. He owes X amount of money. Assume Shimon is perfectly righteous. Keep Shabbat, keep mitzvot, give donations, be merciful to people, honor, everything. But he owes $1,000 to this Reuven. He cannot enter heaven until he pays back the money he owes people. That's the rule. Cannot enter Olam Abag and Eden if you owe money to people. And that's why many people that still in their business today they only hurting themselves. They don't hurt the people that they steal money from. Even though it looks like you put him on the street, you stole his business away, you stole his money away, because of you is bankrupt, because of you he got a heart attack and die, it looks like it's because of you. But if Hashem didn't want him to have it, he wouldn't have it. And if Hashem wanted him to have it, he would have it with or without you. If Hashem wanted him to die young, he would die without you. If Hashem wanted him to lose his money, with or without you, you would have to lose it. Since you wanted to steal the money from him, and Hashem agreed that this guy deserved to lose his money, so he put you together. So whenever somebody come to your neighborhood and knock on your door, and ask for donation, why did he knock on your door and not on the other side? It's all calculated from Shammai because Hashem wanted to give you the test if to give him or not to give. And you fail and it's another minus in your notebook. And it could be the other way around. If a thief walks in the neighborhood and he's thinking which house should I break into and he broke to one particular house, it's no coincidence. The person that needed to lose money, that's why the robber came to his house. If the robber wouldn't come, it would be a hurricane or something else. You have to know one thing. We do not understand the outcome and the chain reaction for every little thing that we do. Sometimes a, a, a guy wants to marry a girl. And the girl, you know, she has one negative thing. He comes to you, he asks you about it, and you go like this. Ah. That's all. You didn't say a word. You just went like this. It would be better off to tell you, to tell him what's negative about her. You tell him what's negative about her, you're allowed. The Torah says in Shidduchim, you have to tell the husband or the wife what's wrong with the other side. They have to know it. If she goes to psychiatrist, you must tell him that. Don't make him a Shidduch before telling the truth. Now he has a choice. He still want to marry her or not. Maybe he doesn't want, maybe he doesn't want a depressed woman that take pills all day. It's his choice. No, you're misleading him. It's called Mekach Ta'ut. If you're misleading him, he can go to the judges in court, to the rabbis, and he goes out from the marriage without giving her a penny. It's called all false marriage. Really, in Shamaim, they never got married. It's called mekach ta'ut. Or if she has another defect, or he has another defect, the Torah says which defect you have to report, which defects you cannot report. The Torah says. So sometimes, by going like this, he decided not to get married to her. And everything now, it's a chain reaction. If they would get married, they have 10 children. One or two of them would be huge rabbis. This rabbi could make thousands of people religious and make Hashem very happy. This is all was prevented from one little move. You went like this. Now, when you went like this, did you ever dream I just murdered 2,000 souls? Well, you're crazy. Well, I did. I went like this. We do a lot worse than this. 
But I'm saying, all his life, he just went like this. He comes to Hashem, I kept Shabbat, yes. I gave donations, yes. I was a good husband, yes. I was a good father, yes. I was an honest businessman, yes. I was speaking Lashon Ara, never. But you killed 2,000 souls. I killed 2,000 souls, yeah, come see. Show you a movie, you want to die, wow, you're already dead. You want to die again? Where will I hide? We're laughing, but something like this really happened. Almost happened. This is, we have to remember this story. It's going to help us a lot in our life. There is one very big rabbi in Israel that passed away 10 years ago, Persian. He was the biggest rabbi in the world, in all aspects. Rav Ben Sion Abba Shaul, that was his name. The biggest rabbi, the biggest Talmud Chacham, the most humble person in the world, and the biggest Mekubal in the world. And suffer more than any person you know. Sicknesses, paralyzed in half of his body, wheelchair, problems. His wife have 12 miscarriages. One boy they had. Suffering hell in his life. And never left the book. It was the biggest chacham in the world. And he told this story to his student, and I want to share it with you. What's the story? One rabbi, his name is Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky. Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky is a very big chacham. He passed away maybe 10, 12 years, 15 years in Monsi. He used to be in Monsi. Many of the Rashi yeshivot in the world are his student. Many yeshivot, many Ashkenazi yeshivot, you go, who's the Rosh Yeshiva? He made them, Rav Yaakov Kaminetsky. He was a very, very big chacham and also perfectly honest. When he was 17, he was in Russia in yeshiva, he went Friday night to eat by a family there. The woman sell fish. The fish wasn't good. Tastes horrible. The woman asked him, Yaakov, you're not eating the fish? You don't like the fish? He didn't want to insult the woman, so he told her, I don't like fish in general. Since that day, until the day he died, he never tasted fish one more time. My Rebbe, my first Rebbe, told me the story that one time he came to him on Shabbat and said, Rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov, how come you never touch fish? I never saw you eating fish. Every Shabbos we're here together in Yeshiva. So he told him, I love fish very much, my favorite food. So why don't you eat fish? Mitzvah in Shabbat to eat fish. He said, yes. But the Torah says you should never lie. Midvar sheker tirchak, stay away from lies, Hashem said. Since it came out of my mouth instantly, I didn't know what to say. I knew that the first time I will eat fish, retroactive, that would be a lie. Seen from the Torah, it's like eating pork, the same thing. I cannot eat fish. This is the kind of person we're talking about. When he was in his 20s, he got married. And you know, in the old days, it wasn't like today, you call your travel agent, two places, first class for tomorrow morning. Or he has his private jet or helicopter on his roof. It was a different kind of lifestyle. Talking about 70, 60, 70 years ago. In Europe, before the Holocaust, he walked with his wife on a very rainy night. Pouring, rain, snow. Now they're going on the way to Slobodka, to the yeshiva. But they're not going to make it. Soon it's going to be dark. So they are looking now for a house with mezuzah. They can knock on the door. That's how it was. Excuse me, can, can you give us a place to sleep until tomorrow morning? They saw the, ne the town before the yeshiva, it's all going. So they looked around, oh, finally they saw one mezuzah. They knock on the door, it's pouring, wind, freezing. Him and his wife, he asked the guy, can you let us in to sleep overnight? We're on the way to Slobodka and we're very freezing here. The guy said, I'm sorry, I cannot let you in. See a guy, beer, black hat, what's going on here? <laughs> what's going on? You knock on the door of an Arab guy, he'll let you in. Christian guy, he'll let you in. What is this? So it's an, in an emergency. We have nowhere to go. We don't know anyone here. We came from very far away. The guy said, I'm very sorry. I cannot let you in. I don't know you. I cannot let you in. 15 minutes, he's begging him, begging him to let them in. It's, no, it's life risk. The guy said, you're wasting my time. I cannot let you in. So, Rabbi Yaakov, it was Yaakov. He was only in his 20s. Say, I see that you have a shed 
in your back. Can we at least stay uh, overnight under the shed? Because at least we're not going to get more wet than the rain. So the guy was thinking for a second. He said, okay, you can stay under there, but don't move from there. Tomorrow morning early, you leave. All right. He goes with his wife all night. They're freezing like this, winds. At least the rain. Okay. Then he continued to walk the next day, Friday. He arrives finally to the yeshiva. Comes. Everybody already knew him. When he was young, he was a big chacham. They welcome him. They get him a room. Everything fine. The next day, in the morning, he goes to the synagogue, Shabbat morning. He sits. They give aliyot to all the people. Who does he see sitting in a crowd? That evil guy. Sitting like this with his beard in a VIP section. <laughs> he sits. All of a sudden, the rabbi calls him up. He gives him the best aliyah on Shabbat. <laughs> So what's going on here? Wow. I can't take this. He comes to the rabbi in the middle. Comes to his ear, rabbi. I cannot tolerate such a thing. Rabbi, how can you give such an evil person an aliyah? How you let him walk into the hall of the yeshiva here, Bechlal? How do you let somebody like this? This is a, 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 He said, oh, what happened to you? He said, oh, well, he made us freeze on the night. All the night he let us in. How can you let him get? He said, he's not a cruel guy. Be quiet, I'll explain you after the davening what happened. By the end of the davening, the rabbi comes to Yaakov Kaminetsky and says, you should know one thing. The night before you came to his house, he let somebody like you walk into the house and sleep there, one guy. And the guy mugged him completely, stole away all his silver, all his uh, money, everything that he had in his house in the middle of the night, he cleaned it and he disappeared in the middle of the night. A robber. He was so frustrated, so he swore, that's it. He's not letting any foreigners into his home, no matter what happened. And the next night, bad, bad luck, tough luck, you and your wife just showed up. And he swore he doesn't let anybody in. But you should know that this is a very generous guy. You know how I many years he's helping the yeshiva and so many other people he's been helping? Now, why do I tell you this story? Because Rav Ben Sion Abba Shaul told this story to his student in Yerushalayim something like 15, 20 years ago. And this is what he said. We have to learn from this Musar. He said, when the thief came there, let's say he stole five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, whatever it was. $10,000, stole some antique, $50,000, whatever, it's money. The thief thinking, the thief knows Torah. In the end, eight years ago, everybody knew Torah, not like today, people don't know how to read. In the old days, everybody knows Torah. The thief knows that Hashem said, if you steal one dollar, you have to return two, if they caught you. If you make tshuva, and you come on your own to return the money before they caught you, you just pay what you stole, not a penny more, no interest, no penalty, no nothing. Because Hashem wants to encourage Jews to make tshuva, repentance. But if the police caught you already, you must pay double. No jail, no nothing. But if you do it too many times, the king can kill you. The king catch you and kill you in front of everyone. That's what happened to a thief, to warn the people. But the Torah say, you must pay double, that's it. So Ben Sion Abba Shaul said, the thief, when he stole that $10,000, he knew in his mind, I am guilty now, and I have to pay actually $20,000. So if I die tomorrow, what do I shame judge me for? For double of what I stole. That's it. That's the maximum it can be. He never dreamed in his life that he's guilty of a holocaust. That's his punishment in Shammai. Why holocaust? Let's calculate what happened. This boy, Yaakov Kaminetsky, in his 20s, that's before he became one of the biggest rabbis in the world. In America, he was one of the top three. He, he, if he would die that night, he would get pneumonia or something like this. In the old days, people would die. Freezing weather, one night outside in freezing zero degrees, that's it. If he would die that night, you wouldn't have all the Torah in America. All the Torah that you see, all these big yeshivot that you see in Brooklyn and this, this is one of the funders of everything. Hundreds of Rosh yeshivot that open yeshivot all over, it's all him. Without him, none of this would happen. So 
if because of that thief, Yaakov Kaminetsky would die 80 years ago, everything we have today wouldn't be. Who would be responsible for that? That little thief that stole $10,000. He comes to Hashem, Hashem say, you destroyed my nation. I destroyed your nation? One time in my life I stole $10,000. That's besides being ungrateful, someone who feed you and you stabbed him in the back. That's besides the point. And this is just one example how bad it can be, one little thing that you do and you're not even responsible for how far it can travel. Everybody in this world are seeking for happiness. Everybody trying to be happy. We all know that all the people in the world, all of them, with no exception, are not happy. Every non-religious person in the world never reached happiness. Convenience, having money, having nice car, having beautiful jewelry, everybody knows that it doesn't bring happiness. It brings temporary illusion that looks like, looks like happiness. A person never had a car. He worked a few years, he saved, he bought a little Toyota. I don't know, $15,000. He saved, he worked for a whole year like crazy. When he got his first car, for one month he feels very excited. He goes out of his home in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock, he goes down to the parking lot, he looks at the car. Wow, my darling, you know. That's his happiness. A month later, he cannot spit at this car. Or he had a little apartment. Studio apartment. Oh, finally, I have a room on my own. Oof, enough with these parents killed me already. Do this, do not do this, don't go, don't come back late. You forgot the alarm. You're living here, why don't you do anything? Baruch Hashem, I'm independent. Two years later, he moved to a beautiful three bedrooms. Try to get him back to the one, uh, to the studio. It's a, it's a nice, it's a, it's a dead sentence for him. You want to bring me back to this place? What do you mean? Three years ago you danced when you moved here. You are the same person. What's the difference? Now you take him out of the free bedroom, you move him to, into the nicest mansion in the world. He press a button, the swimming pool comes out of the living room, oh, everything you want to think about. You know? Like this guy, Mike Tyson. $30 million in 20 minutes. What did he do? Lost everything. <laughs> One time I heard that, <laughs> that he drove with his Ferrari in Midtown Tunnel 170 kilometers an hour, which is like about 110 miles an hour inside Midtown Tunnel. How can he drive so fast in the, in the middle of the night? The cops pulled him over. The Ferrari cost $700,000, the best Ferrari in the world, handmade, the top Ferrari. He told the cop, the Ferrari is yours, let me go. <laughs> doesn't want to lose his license. I don't know the rest of the story, if the cop took it or not. That's a different story. Probably he did, but this is it. So he had a house, 60 bedrooms. 60 bedrooms. Looks like a hotel from the outside, the size of the house. He needed cash today. He sold his house for $5 million. It's worth like 80, 70, 80 million dollars. He needed cash today. Somebody came, wrote him a check, $5 million, he sold it. I'm just giving you an example. A person, the more he grows financially, it's only one moment of pleasure and it, le and it goes. That's it. And it, it doesn't make him happy. They ask Bill Gates in Israel, Mr. Gates, that's about a year ago, in an interview in, in prime time. You are the right person to ask. Does money bring happiness? I was, I already knew he's going to say no, but I was surprised the way he said the no. He almost killed her. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's convenient. It saves some headaches, but it doesn't bring happiness. And this is his answer to her. When I die, I would leave my children. I guess he has more than one. Only $10 million. At that time, it was worth about $60 billion at that time. So he's planning to leave his children, and he said that in prime time, only $10 million. So I was thinking to myself, he can't even buy a house in Great Lakes. <laughs> the son of Bill Gates come, hey, uh, uh, Mr. Musa. He comes to us, a Persian Jew here. Say, I want to buy your house. Here, my name is Gate. How much is the house? $10 million. Oh, can you do something for me? 
What do you mean? You Bill Gates? No, you. No, but look, my father only left me five million dollars. Why? He hates his children, Mr. Gates? I'm sure he doesn't. He didn't want to destroy their life. I have an uncle, Persian, in Israel. Next time you go to Israel, if you go to the north, remember this. On the way to the north, to all the graves of the righteous people in the north, you, you pass through Afula. Afula is a little cute town on the way to the north. If you ever want to taste the best pizza in the entire world, the entire universe, and I'm not exaggerating, you don't find it anywhere. Not in Italy, not in New York, never. You stop in the center of Afula, tell them Rimini pizza. You go there, you never forget what pizza is. You don't want to taste pizza here in New York anymore. So he's Persian. And Baruch Hashem, Hashem blessed him. He has businesses. Not only the store, he has a lot of businesses. Since we were kids, his children, my cousins, and us, we didn't have anything. We didn't have money. But him, his children, he could get them cars, he could get them anything they want. They live such simple life. Sometimes I wasn't sure whose father is rich, me or him. My cousins. Each one of my cousins became a hard-working guy. Independent, work, not afraid. If they have to work in a door, they work in a door. If the Arab guy didn't come to work, they work. The Russian guy, the cleaning guy didn't come, they clean. And even my uncle comes five in the morning, every morning to prepare the door. He can be in a yacht somewhere in the Caribbean. He has enough money probably to live until age 1,000. But humble people, he sits on a Persian rug and play sheshbesh with the little kids. Why humble? Being humble is a very good gift. Tsanua. Some people, as soon as they make money, they think they are God. Comes Hashem and say, the number one sickness of a person in life is pride. Poison that you cannot imagine how bad it is. And it gets to a point, believe it or not, that when a person is proud, Hashem is staying away from him. No help to this guy. Why? Hashem say, me and him cannot be in the same room. Why? He's a proud guy. What's the big deal? He is God, not me. Let him run the show. I, you don't need me here. Let him be. Let him be. Let him do everything. It's me and me and me. What's the Torah says? Kochi ve'otze miyadi asali itachayil hazeh. He comes to his wife. What a, what a deal I made. I did this. I convinced the bank. I fooled the lawyer. I sent him a fax. He didn't pay attention. I tricked them. I convinced the investor to do the deal anyway. Without me, none of this would be. <laughs> And Hashem is sitting there laughing at this guy. I did everything and he takes credit. And this is us. Each one of us takes credit for things we never did. The same geniuses in this business, all these advisors, all these political and financial advisors that uh, spoke in the United States in the last 10, 15 years, do this, do that, they all were wrong. The economy all collapsed overnight here. And everything they say now, it's even worse than before. They fool the people. Things, the economy shows some signs of improvement. Every retail business is going out of business in this place. But they continue to say on the news, the economy is showing signs of improvement. Just today, not that many people know, I have a friend, Baruch Hashem, when you deal with Baalei Tshuva, some of them are important people in their field. Baal Tshuva means Jews that you turn them to, make, to become religious, to become Shomer Shad. So some of them I personally turn religious. Some of them through the website or through the DVDs. One guy is out of New York. He has connection with the inside secret service, FBI, government people. So he said to me that Obama today, 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 it's from today. You don't see it on the news. Maybe it will be on the news in a month or two. Begged begged Saudi Arabia uh, king and all the Arab kings that, you know, they own all the oil to invest hundreds of billions of dollars in America if they don't want America to collapse and they will collapse with it. Now remember, 7% of America owned by one family. 
One Arab guy, Sheikh Bander, owns 7% of the economy in all over the United States. When he comes to New York, they close blocks. 70 FBI cars around him. Whatever he say, he play the flute, and the American president are all dancing. He owns everything. He always threat them, I'll take away my money. You know what's going to happen? If tomorrow this Arab, his wife, didn't make him the coffee the way he likes, or the servant, he can get very angry and call Obama, I want my hundreds of billions of dollars wire right now to Saudi Arabia. What's going to be? Or China. If China decides tomorrow morning to close the faucet, not to invest anymore in America. You can own the whole United States. It's going to worth zero. Nothing. It's not, nothing will have a value here. Only Hashem decides what you're going to have, what you're not going to have. People are not realizing. The more you run after material life, the more miserable you become. The more miserable you become. People who never had too much, they never sit and cry what the deal I missed. I didn't have this, I didn't have this. A person has to focus on his spiritual life. Once a person is fulfilled spiritually, everything around him doesn't matter anymore. Tragedies, it's not the end of the world. Why? Person, God forbid, God forbid a mother lost her, her child. God forbid. A mother that doesn't have Hashem in her life, she would be miserable all her life. You're not going to make her happy with giving her millions of dollars. She had a little seven years old boy and he got cancer and died. You're going to give her a billion dollar check. It's going to make her happy. Come on. Take away my home. Take away my car. Leave me on the street. Give me the boy back, right? But if she knows that this life is only one station in a trip, that's it. So another few years before she realizes it, she's going to get back with that soul together. It's only a temporary, like she sent her son to college for a few years. He's away. In the old days, that's how, that's how it was. You know, people couldn't fly from one place to the other. They didn't have cars like today. Somebody went to college 200 years ago, he would see his parents maybe once a year, if, if even, maybe once every three years. That's how it was. Husbands that used to go to learn Torah, like you read in the Gemara, they came back after 12 years. The Gemara said one rabbi, he decided to be like Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva left his wife, he took a, a Jap, Jewish American princess. Her, her, her husband was Kalba Savua. What does it mean, Kalba Savua? Everyone who comes to him hungry like a kelev, like a dog, savua. He gives him plenty of food. He's full now for two weeks. Food, everything, free of charge. That's how rich he was. When the Romans made an ambush around Yerushalayim for three years, he fed all the people of Yerushalayim with his storages and money. That's how rich he was. And his daughter is a beautiful, gorgeous, pretty, a, a rich, grew up in the highest class, in the nicest neighborhood in Israel. Who did she end up marrying? The guy who cleans the horses. Rabbi Akiva. Age 40, divorce, with a boy. Doesn't know alphabet. Doesn't have a penny in his pocket. Doesn't know how to read. How to read, he doesn't know. Now imagine... If you own a big empire, financial empire, you're the richest guy in New York, your daughter grew up in the best schools, and all of a sudden your daughter, I don't know, in her 20s, young, young girl, she brings a guy, 40 years old, divorced with a kid. <laughs> yes, can I help you? What are you doing? Cleaning the horses. Look at him with his clothes, and she wants to marry him. So what happened? He threw her out of the house. You're not my daughter anymore. But not because of what you think. You think he's going to embarrass the father because she took a poor guy. It's not our class, Rabbi. We came from Iran, from this place, and they are from that place. My son cannot marry the daughter. It's a good girl. I'm not saying no. But we're not in the same level. Rabbi, it cannot be. Same thing by the Bukharians, same thing by the Ashkenazim, by the Syrian, by everybody. By the Goim, same thing. Why it's like this? People are ignorant. They forgot that God is a matchmaker. And sometimes he wants a prince with a poor girl. That's good for both of them. For him it's good in one way. For her it's good in one way. And that's the best way. 
And the father comes and breaks it and doesn't let it happen, and he destroys their future. That's it. Fune, everything is finished. Now he's going to marry somebody else, she's going to marry somebody else, they'll never be happy, they get divorced, problems with the kids, and nobody knows why. Why? The parents destroy them. Why? He should have not listened to them. There was his shiduch. She's righteous? Marry her. He's righteous? Marry him. What did she see in Rabbi Akiva? Humbled person. Down to earth, nice, shy, cannot look in the eyes when he talk. So she told him, I'm willing to marry you in one condition, that you go to learn Torah. <laughs> now she's going to lose her father billions, inheritance. She's going to move into a special house that they made from straw. That's how poor they were. They didn't have nothing, no money, nothing. She's going to live now with straw around her. No cars, no maids, nothing that she got used to. It's a real story. This, this, thanks to her, we are here today. She moved into the house and he goes away for 12 years. 12 years later, Rabbi Akiva returned and he sees the neighbors make fun at his wife. So now he's 52 years old and the wife probably in her 30s and the, the neighbor laughs at her. <laughs> You're going to be an old woman. Your husband forgot about you. 12 years you married. No children, no nothing. So she answered, if I could have a way to get my husband to tell him, I would tell him to go for 12 more years. If he learns Torah, anyway, we don't live for this life. We are preparing our next life. Over there, it's eternity. She was clever. Rabbi Akiva heard that this is what his wife told the neighbor. He turned around and went for another 12 years. Everybody asked, 12 more years. Everybody asked. He couldn't come in, hug his wife, give her a, give her a kiss. Hug, eat Gondi with her until the morning. <laughs> Tomorrow she walk him back to the train. Wow, come on, he's such a cool person. Twelve years you didn't see your beautiful wife. Now you come on, what, what is this? Chachamim answered, if you walk in, you wouldn't go tomorrow. That's it. You go into a warm bed, you see your wife after twelve years. Ah, you're going to go back. The Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination is very clever. Only a kiss, Rabbi. I'm Shomer Negiyah. Only a little bit. I let my boyfriend only touch my hand. That's in the first week. What happened to the second week? Second week, he's already touched the neck, then a hug, then a kiss, then two weeks later, Dad, you're going to kill me. <laughs> I have something to tell you. You know the rest, right? That's what happened. Thousands of cases like this. The Torah says, stay away until you get married. People want to do it their way. We pay the price. So Rabbi Akiva went back, came back after 24 years. 24,000 students are walking with him, each one of them like an angel in his level. All of a sudden, he see a man runs to him, a very old man. He hardly recognized him. This is Kalba Savua, the billionaire. Rabbi, they say you're the biggest rabbi in the world. He doesn't recognize that he's his son-in-law, that he threw him out of his home 24 years ago. Rabbi, I have to untie a vow. I made a vow, and I regret it. So what is your vow? He said, I threw out my daughter and my son-in-law, and I said, they're not my children anymore. And now I'm about to die. I have all this empire. Who would I give it to? I want to give it to my daughter. So he asked him, why did you tell your son-in-law that you don't want him because he was poor or because he didn't know Aleph Bet he didn't know Torah I said poor I care about poor I have enough money for everyone that's not what bothered me they didn't care about pride poor not poor he was Amaaretz complete ignorant big embarrassment doesn't know Aleph Bet Torah age 40 doesn't know Torah so he told them I'm your son-in-law imagine the situation then, all of a sudden, they see a woman cover the hair like this coming. By now, she's already 40-something years old. She comes like this. The men say, hey, woman, it's thousands of people, rabbis here. Why are you walking in between? It's not modest. <laughs> so Rabbi Akiva saw his wife. He said, move, move, let her come. All the Torah of all of us together combined belongs to her. Just imagine what a woman can earn in one short lifetime. So she gave up money, she did for Hashem. What was in the end? He gave all his money to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva became the richest guy in the world. 
Not only that, five different places later he got treasures from. The wife of the Caesar Roman, Tornostropus, her husband died, she converted, and Rabbi Akiva married her, and she brought all the wealth of the Romans to Rabbi Akiva. That's how rich he became. Six different places, the richest guy in the world. Before he died, they put him in a, in a jail, because he was teaching Torah, the Romans. And a guy used to bring him water every day. He used to make netilat yadayim, drink. That's how it was. One time the Romans kicked the, the water. There was not enough water. The guy came to Rabbi Akiva and said, look, I'm, I only have half of the water I bring you every day. So he said, Rabbi Akiva, okay, I have to make netilat yadayim. I want to eat the bread. He said, no, forget about netilat yadayim. Go drink water. You're an old man. You need water. He said, how would I eat the bread? This is the kind of people we're talking about. So one rabbi... Rabbi Chama Barbisa, that was his name. He wanted to be like Rabbi Akiva. So one time he came to his wife and he said, I'm going to learn Torah. Six years later, he returned to town. Remember, it wasn't like today. You go in the morning to the yeshiva, at night you get into your car, you come back. What's for dinner, mommy? That's today. That's why none of our kids is Talmine Chachamim. None of them. But in the old days... Six years later, he comes back to town, and he see they changed the entire town. They made new ways, new paths, trees. Everything is different. So he asked the people, how do I get to the shul? They told him, go here. He comes to the shul. The shul is still there. He goes inside. He see a one little kid, six years old. We almost finished. One six years old kid learning Torah with another man. He started to cry. Rabbi Chama Barbisa began to cry. He said, wow, what a mistake I made, maybe. My wife was pregnant, and I left her, and I went to yeshiva. Six years, I learned a lot of Torah. Now I came back home. I looked at this boy. I could have had a boy like this boy. If I would stay here, I would teach my son Torah. I would be like this boy. What a gift. Such a genius boy, knows so much Torah in this age. He's hitting his heart. Finally, he asked the people, how do I get to my home? He gets home, he sees his wife. Very good. They sitting. Ten minutes later, he see a boy is bringing water from the well. He comes with the water. Who does he see? That smart boy from the yeshiva. He rises. He got up. So the wife said, "Oh, what are you standing?" He say, "A big talmid chacham walk into the room. It's a kid, but it's a big giant." She said, "The wife, <laughs> I never saw a father is rising for his son. That was his son." Why the Gemara brings this story? This is what Hashem says in the Torah. Remember this. Birzot Hashem darke ish gam oivav yashlim imo. When God is satisfied from you, even your enemies become your lovers. Your wife will never give you a hard time. Your children will not rebel against you. Your brothers, your parents, your neighborhood, your partners in business. When you are not doing right, you're behaving crooked, the whole world is against you. It's his fault, it's her fault, it's your mother's fault, it's your cousin's fault, it's everyone's fault except my fault. The Torah says like this, there's only one way to be happy in this life. I made your soul, I made your body, I made marriage, I made children, I made food, I made relation, I made everything. Everything. I'm the manufacturer. Who would you trust on advice? Dr. Root or me? Who do you want to trust? You trust her, you'll be in a mental home. Where are you going to be? You want to have a good, healthy marriage? All her patients are all in mental cases. One by one. They all divorced six times already, include her. Ask her how many times she got divorced. The psychologist, they give advices against the Torah. Go see if it's working for them. The number one committing suicide group, psychologist and psychiatrist. And they're going to tell me how to be healthy mentally. Come on. God says like this, my children, don't look for material success in this world. Anyway, it all comes from me. I give you no matter what, I'll give it to you anyway. Don't eat your heart with this. Don't be greedy, don't be stingy, just follow my rules. 
In the end, I'm going to write in your notebook a mark, 60, 70, 80, 90, like in kindergarten, like in school. How much you got? A hundred. Here is a candy. Why? You passed the test, very good. What happened if you only got 80 on the test? It's better than to get 40. But what about the 20 that you missed? We have to pay for it. We don't want to pay for this 20, trust me. Even for one, we don't want. We want to get 100, not 99. Why? Because it's very painful. If you read the Torah carefully, you see that whatever we messed up, we're going to be responsible for that. So the idea is to be clever today, not tomorrow. When you're 20, 30, 40, you're still alive, you're still running, you're still able to achieve the whole world. Whatever God gave you, use for the right goal. What is the right goal? A ticket to the world of eternity. God says today to make the mitzvot, tomorrow in the next world to get the reward. And people don't realize. There's the eye who watch over you. There's the ear who listens to you. And everything you do is registered in the book of God. That's what God says. And people forget that. They forget that everything they do, there's a camera who films. Everything they say, it's been recorded. Eventually, every word came from our mouth. We will have to see the scenario, the situation. We hurt people, we lie, we gamble, we cheat. Whatever we did, we're going to die from the embarrassment. Only when a person is achieving spiritually, is happy. Remember the rule. If the person's life spiritually is empty, his soul is dead. When the soul is dead, that's what we call today depression. That's why five out of ten people that we meet, they're all depressed. How can it be? All these Hollywood stars are all depressed. How are they all taking drugs? Almost all of them. It's hard to find one that doesn't take drugs. Why people are running to drugs? Because they try to get out of their loneliness, their misery. Sometimes they have a husband and ten children in a house and they're still miserable. They're lonely. The soul is dying inside. The soul only is happy when you hear Torah, when you do mitzvot. This is the way God made it. Now you may tell me, I do sometimes mitzvot. It doesn't make me anything happy. True. 100%. What is it like? Take a pot, fill it up with water, and you want to boil the water. You put it on the stove. One second, you take it off. Five seconds, take it off. Five seconds, take it off. For one year like this. There's going to be any difference in the water? Nothing. The Torah says, Mishpate Hashem Nechmadin Tzadeku Yachdav. If you constantly go into a system, few years that you go into the system, the more you do, the happier you get. I have a cousin, he used to be an officer in the army. He finished the army. You know how he became religious? This is a story for us to learn, and we'll finish with this. He was in the army, an officer in Lebanon war, the first war. Very, very smart guy. Since he wasn't religious, he was the president of the organization of the national, and all the students of Israel, he was their president. He was talking to ministers in the government. He was a very smart person. Every test, a hundred, a very talented person. As a non-religious guy, he has a beautiful girlfriend, he has a driver in the army that drives him, he has his own car. You know, in Israel, in the standards of Israel, you don't need more than this. One time, his, his older brother, heard that there's a seminar in Tel Aviv. They lived in Bat Yam at that time. So his parents went to the seminar in Tel Aviv. It's from Friday until uh, Sunday. And he was the babysitter of the dog. They had a little dog, Billy. Little dog in Israel, all the dogs, they have American names. I don't know why. <laughs> Instead of calling them Ahmed, Mustafa, they call them Billy, Steve. <laughs> That's how the dogs in Israel are. So anyway. So he was the babysitter of Billy. Friday night, Shabbat, his other friend, I, used to, I grew up with these guys. I will be two, three years old, older than me. He told him, we want to go to Elat tonight. We have a car, five hours, three hours, whatever, we're in Elat. You're coming with us for the weekend in Elat? He said, sure, I want to come, but I'm stuck with this dog, Billy. He said, leave the dog in the house. Leave Billy home. Not Clinton, Billy. 
<laughs> so he said, leave Billy at home. He said, no, it's not. Come on, the dog is going to suffer. He said, no, leave him some water, leave him some food. He said, no, I'm afraid. My mother's going to know. She's going to get upset. So he said, okay, where are your parents? He said, in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is in the opposite direction. About half an hour to the opposite of Elat. Tel Aviv is north and Elat is south. Say, so, yeah, what's the problem? Let's drive there now, give them Billy in a hotel in Tel Aviv. So we go to Elat. He said, you know what, that's a good idea. Let's go to Tel Aviv. I'll never forget this. I was in the army, and he was already an officer a few years in the army after the three years. So they go there. He brings Billy when on Shabbat. I used to have curly hair. <laughs> Why wow, does all the, all the fancy rabbis over there? They have seminar, you know, they speak in Shabbat. They eat Shabbos meal. Shalom Aleichem. <laughs> he walks in with Billy. He has curly black hair and Billy has curly black hair. He goes like this. He brings Billy inside. <laughs> His mother wanted to die. Imagine in front of all the rabbis, he show up with a dog. He said, what's the problem? He said, I didn't want to leave him home. We're going to Elat. She was so embarrassed, so she told the rabbis, you know, he brought the dog, what we should, what should we do, you know? So the rabbi said, no problem, for, put the dog in the room, no problem. But well, what's with you? You're not a Jew? He started to talk to him. Maybe ten minutes he talked to him, he convinced him to stay in the seminar. <laughs> to my cousin, the rabbi convinced now he wants to go to Elad, the guy is waiting in a car. <laughs> he said, stay in the seminar. Sometimes a person, that's what the Torah says, Yesh Adam kone olamo berega achat. There's a one in, once in a lifetime opportunity. Once in a lifetime. Ten minutes, boom, or not. One of the two. And the rest of the life, it's, that's it. So he decided to stay, because the rabbi, he saw that the rabbi is very clever, very sharp. Then it was Rav Neugier Shel over there, another genius rabbi. So he saw that the rabbis there are not what he thought started to argue with him, he liked the argument, the rest is history. Now today, he's such a big rabbi, he's a big rabbi, that I never saw anybody in the world that is in his level yet. And I met a lot of important rabbis. He's a mekubal, he was learning with the rabbi that I told you before, I've been seeing on Abba Shaul for 12 years. He was his student. When you have the best rabbi in the world as your rabbi, you become somebody, he wrote a book in Kabbalah, I show it to some big rabbis here. He's a very big chacham. Not only that, in the end he married the daughter of Rabbi Uri Zohar. That is a big rab, Rabbi Uri Zohar. He was here a few times in Great Neck. even spoke in English here a few months ago. He's also a very famous Baal Tshuva. He used to be a movie star and a filmmaker and became a Baal Tshuva, the first one. So now here is the story. A person like him, you beg him come to a party or family event in Tel Aviv, just for two hours. So it's a punishment for me. Can't leave the Torah. One time I took two wealthy guys to Jerusalem to see the yeshiva, to help the yeshiva. Now I knew the mind of these American Jews. They live in mansions, one of them in Forest Hill Gardens, and another one is very wealthy. They make a lot of money in the stock market, very easy, punch some numbers and making millions. I know that they don't understand the value of Torah. Wealthy people that don't, they're not so connected to the Torah, they don't understand that the Torah is the foundation of the Jewish life. They don't understand. But if you show them poverty, they have guilty feelings. Why do I live in a $10 million house and I spend thousands of dollars every week on food and these people leave seven children in one tiny room and they hardly have food, the kids are fighting for a piece of bread, I know, what should I talk? Let me, one picture equal like a million words. I just show them where they live, that's it. It will do the job. So 10 o'clock at night, I told these guys, let's go to my cousin. I want to visit him. We're on the way here in Yerushalayim. So they said, okay, why not? So I told them, I bet you now when we get there, he's going to be with a book open, learning Gemara. 10 o'clock at night, after learning from 6 in the morning. They say, even at night he learns? Cannot live without it. He doesn't want to go into the bathroom because he's suffering from not learning five minutes. That's how his soul enjoys every second. Le deal, like someone that needs drugs, how does he need it? And when he gets it, it relaxes him. This is like how a person, the soul, when the soul enjoys from the Torah of God, 
If I will describe it to you in a million years, you don't understand what we're talking here about. But the stipler, of the father of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, when he used to finish the Gemara, he used to dance around the table. You look at him, you think he's crazy. He had Ruach HaKodesh. In the war, they brought a list of 36 soldiers to give him blessing. He was sitting in Bnei Brak. The stipler, you have pictures of him in every house. He looks at the list, seven of them he crossed out. So Rabbi, why you made lines on those names? He said, they already died. You cannot give them bracha. He's sitting in Bnei Brak and you see what happened in Egypt. That's Rav, the father of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, the stipler. He used to dance around the table, holding the Gemara, dancing. Like a person wants to jump from the empire, standing from happiness. Can never reach such a thing. So he, we went there at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> I opened the door. The size of the apartment is like the size of the bathroom here. The entire apartment. Nine children are sleeping in one tiny three beds, one on top of the other. The house is full of books. The happiest couple in the world. You cannot believe how happy these people are. So we walk in, he's standing like this, with the standing with the stand there, learning. I told him, no, 10 o'clock at night. I said, come at 2 o'clock at night, it's the same thing. Happy, real happiness. And not only that, earning billions of mitzvot every week. Every letter of Torah, it's eternity. Nobody can take it away from you. And what happened? The guy saw how they live. They decided to sponsor the entire yeshiva. It was 12 guys learning, all of a sudden, in a few months, it became 24. Learned Torah around the clock, on the top of a building in Yerushalayim, and they sponsor everything, these guys. Why? When Hashem is happy from one person, He brings them all the way to Him. He doesn't know how to collect money, He doesn't want to leave Yerushalayim, He doesn't want to leave the book. Hashem got them all the way from New York to come to His apartment 10 o'clock at night. From tomorrow morning, they doubled His yeshiva. This is the goal here. You have to make peace with Hashem, nothing else. Everything else will fall into place. And if it doesn't, you shouldn't be upset. What are you upset of? Remember the story with the guy that the guy was beating him up? The more agony we have, the more we're earning. The more frustration we have, the more we're earning. What do you want? You want pleasure for 20 years supposedly here? Or you want billions of years of pleasure? That's the question. After watching the DVD, it will be, the picture will be a lot clearer. You're going to see, maybe you didn't raise that way. It's hard after 40, 50 years to make a switch and become somebody else. But it's possible. Rav Uri Zohar was a filmmaker, even in Hollywood already, he had business and connection. He was on prime time television in Israel every night, the most famous guy in Israel. He, he argued for three days with the rabbi, he showed him the Torah is divine. And he said, from this moment on, after I knew this is a book that God gave, I couldn't live anymore the way I used to. Why? How do you enjoy life knowing every second of your life you're going to have to pay for the mistakes that you make? How can you enjoy the sin knowing there's a very heavy price for it? How can a person enjoy taking a credit card from the bank, going, buying all kinds of things, knowing in one month he's going to get a huge bill and he's not going to know what to do? And interest and penalties, how can you enjoy? You bought shoes knowing you cannot afford to pay it. You're not enjoying from the shoes because you know the bill is on the way. When you live in illusion, you think, oh, everything is fine, Rabbi. We're dancing, we're happy, we eat good, vacation, there's nothing to worry about. Our kids are all doctors. That's not the purpose of life. A person has to know why God put me here. If he never found out, every second of his life is a waste. Remember this, the last word of tonight. In order for you to be successful in life and earn a ticket to the world to come, you first have to recognize what is your mission here. Why God put you here? And the answer is not to make money, not to be healthy. Not to be nothing, just to be one thing, righteous. Single righteous, married righteous, righteous with children, righteous without children, righteous healthy, righteous very sick, righteous with lots of problems in business, righteous with no problem in business, that's his decision. One thing, it's your decision. If to be righteous or wicked, nobody asks you if you be a male or a female. If you be healthy in your life, or you have sicknesses. If you be wealthy or not, this is all predecided for you. 
One thing, it's a hundred percent in your hand, and that's the purpose of life. Shomer Shabbat, it's in my hand. Giving donations to the poor, it's in my hand. Being a good wife, being a good husband, it's in my hand. It's my character, my personality. Correct my negativity, my pride, my anger, my stinginess, my laziness, and all the other problems that we have, this is in, all in my hand. Everything that is in my hand, I'm liable for. Everything is not, nobody will punish you that you cannot fly from the Empire State Building. It's not a purpose of life. Nobody will punish you if you're not Bill Gates or you're not Donald Trump, financially. No, I, I didn't want you to be. You can do whatever you want. I'm not, I am not interested you be like them. I want you a simple guy with $2,000 a month salary. That's what I want you. This is the test I set for you. What are you killing yourself to be him? Your test is different than him. Your reward is much greater than him or depend on the scenario. Why do you want to be him? Because you don't trust me that I know what I'm doing. To be happy, it's never ever possible before you connect to God 100% every second of your life. This is what David Amelech writes in Tehillim. I'm sure you read Tehillim. Show me your way, show me your path, make me close to you, help me to be closer to you, to see the brilliance of you, to see no, to know more. What did he ask for? Never for money, never for nothing. All the Tehillim is David Amelech begging Hashem, I hope I can be next to you, sitting in your home all my life. Nothing else he cared, nothing. David Amelech was the richest guy in Israel, the king. He was sitting and, and checking the... the the cloth of nida of the women. Like the simple rabbis today. The women come, they put their nida in a drawer, he check, pure, not pure. That was what he was doing. The richest guy, a king. Humble, that's what he says in Tehillim, I'm a warm. That's what he feels. And God say, you're right. You feel that you're warm, you're humble. That's why I love you. Moshe Rabbeinu, why God love him so much? Because he's humble. Anybody was more rich than Moshe, more famous than Moshe? God is speaking to him every day, he's humble. King David, humble. Aaron, humble. All the greatest leaders in history became what they are because they were humble. They remember, I am the creation and Hashem is the creator. If a person doesn't recognize that he's in a darkness, he has no chance to come out of the darkness. Nothing whatsoever. The road to happiness is only being connected to Hashem. I once took a person to an autistic kids nine years ago in Brooklyn. Autistic kids is all soul, not body. This woman lived with another man. She's divorced. She met a guy. She wanted to get married with him that he will get her out of her loneliness. When she walked into the room, she, she didn't even sit on a chair. The autist started to punch, you know, they're holding his hand. He doesn't even look at the keyboard, you know, if you ever know what I'm talking about. The autist started to punch his letters. What was the message? He's not for you, the guy. You think that people can get you out of your loneliness and out of your misery. That's the word of the soul of that autistic kid. Nobody can make you happy. Nobody will get you out of your misery. Only Hashem can do it for you. And the goal, to do, the, the, the condition to do it for you is that you're going to change your life, your lifestyle, and get closer to Him. Once you're going to do it, He's going to help you a lot because He knows where you're coming from, and He's going to help you a lot. But you have to make the first move. That was the word. She started to ask another question about the guy. He didn't want to answer her. He wasn't moving his hand. She did, he didn't know even who she is. She just walked into the room. He already knew what the question she has to ask. Saul, by the way, forget about him. It's not for you. She didn't listen. He moved into her. He never married her. And in the end, guess what happened? He didn't have a place to live. He got stuck in her place for years. And her heart doesn't let her throw him to the street. They got stuck together, never got married. The autist was right 100%. It never made her happy in her life. Only the situation got worse. Life, Hazan say, it's a blink of the eye. 
before you realize it's over, don't fall in love with this phony materialistic life. It's all an illusion. It's all a poison. The more you love it, the more miserable it's going to make you. It will never make you happy. And in the worst scenario, in the end, you come naked. God, I did some things. I paid you for all your mitzvot. The little that you did, I paid you. You're empty now. I owe you nothing. What do you have? You have donations? Once. Once every 10 years? I paid you for that. Uh, I made a peace between my friend and her husband. I paid you for that. You got another house in Miami. What do you think? Not, millions of people in the world are dying to have another house that they can go and relax. I gave it to you. So I paid you for everything. What do you want? I owe you nothing. But I did this. I did that. Hashem shows I paid you for everything. What you're really supposed to do, Shabbat, modesty, integrity, personality, generosity, you didn't do. You fell. Who wants to find out after 80 years that he's a big loser? All his life was in the wrong direction. And it's all come from one thing, ignorance. The more ignorant we are, the more we damage ourselves. Bezrat Hashem, I want to thank you very much for coming. Thank you for the organizer. I'm sorry for the confusion that we almost moved to another place. Hopefully, I think in two weeks, we're going to have a big event in Great Neck. They started to work on it. As of tomorrow, they're going to start to arrange it. So I'm sure you're going to hear the rumor in town. We're going to do without any confusion, Bezrat Hashem. But it, was, it worked out very good. I also have another good lecture for the website. If you want, like I say, I have some free DVDs here. Thank you very much, and good night.